Hi, I'm Jamie. This is Dead Dodge Garage, and this is another tuning project. Avid viewers of my channel will recognize this as the 1973 Dodge Charger I call Toolbox. I call it Toolbox because two and a half years ago, I traded my Maco Toolbox for it. It was a total basket case in need of everything at that time. Later, I sold the car to my friend Tracy, and we've been restoring it ever since. The car is exactly the same as you saw it at the end of the last video, except it did go back to Les Schwab and they were able to align the front end. So that's great. There's a lot left that needs to happen. For example, those grill inserts. The one is broken and the other one's just kind of ugly. So we're still waiting on the new ones to come in the mail. That'll clean the look up considerably. We still haven't had the heater control cable made, but that's okay. We don't really have a blower motor yet either, so. Have I fixed the goofy taillight? No. No, I have not. We've got about 20 miles on the car so far. All things considered, it's done fine. I am going to strongly suggest Tracy invest in a front sway bar. And we still need to install the eight and three quarter axle. Uh, yeah. If you saw the last video, you heard what this engine sounds like. Basically, in a word, it's awesome. But to this point, I have done zero tuning. That is an out of the box, remanufactured electronic distributor. I don't know what curves in it. I could guess. I just kind of eyeballed it to get this thing running. So yeah, we need to address that. Now timing curves and distributor modifications, that's a subject I've talked about a lot on the channel. The main video I did was called Performance Timing Curves for Dummies Like Me. In that video, I modified the MSD distributor in my Demon here. It worked out pretty well. Now I don't want to beat a dead horse here by rehashing all of that information. If you want my in-depth thoughts on why this is important and the basic steps you need to go through to figure out what you need, go watch that Performance Timing Curves video. I'm gonna show you what I do for this particular combination, which, depending on how things look, might be a little bit different than what I've done in the past. Some months back, Chris Birdsong did a video where he advocated using manifold vacuum for the distributor. He was doing this on Performance Built 440s. I've never had any luck with that technique on my average small block builds, but on the last 440 I had to tune, it actually worked out great. We're probably gonna give that a try here. I've shown these techniques on video multiple times, but the thing is, every engine, every combination is a little bit different. Take this thing, for example. I did a tuning video on this thing a while back. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit more than a tuning video coming in the near future, but that's another story altogether. I just like attacking as many of these slightly different situations as possible, so I can build a wider knowledge base of what works, what's easiest, what doesn't work at all, what to avoid, and that sort of thing. I know you viewers find this stuff useful because you ask me about it all the time, so I'll take you along for the ride. Here's why your timing curve is so important. It's not just about horsepower. Yes, we want horsepower. We want a snappy engine with great performance. We want to be able to roast the tires at will. But also, if the timing is too far advanced, you're going to experience pre-ignition, or pinging, which is basically going to be trying to melt down your pistons all the time. And if your timing is not advanced enough, it's too late or retarded, you won't have enough engine vacuum to run your brakes, you'll have a rich fuel mixture, your engine will start like crap, nothing good will come of that. And the moment you try to build a performance engine, like this one, the stock curve in that distributor is completely worthless. It's time to give it a tune. With all that said, it's time to dig in. The first step is firing this thing up, warming it up, and then checking the current timing to establish a baseline. I totally forgot. I had a weird issue with this choke not working, even though this is definitely 12 volt ignition and it's definitely grounded. Don't know what the deal is there, but I'm gonna go ahead and cut my zip tie and see if it works now. Unfortunately, if you've got a wacky camshaft, crappy cold starting is kind of the name of the game. But it doesn't have to be that bad. What the? What is going on? Uh, it's like losing spark. This thing's giving me all the symptoms of a bad ballast resistor. It's brand new. That was weird. Now it's fine. If you remember the very, very end of the last video, it did this weird thing where it wouldn't fire at all. But what it just did was totally different. I don't know what the deal is there. It sounds pretty good as it is, I must say. Oh, that reminds me, I need to tighten the alternator belt. Why did it die? Why? 
I just need to raise the cold idle or get the timing right. Oh yeah, the gas gauge is slowly, slowly coming up, like over several days. Like I said, it doesn't run too bad how it is. The choke is definitely getting warm. It doesn't seem to actually be opening. My random ear ball put the timing at 27 degrees. That's without any advance from that distributor, so that means the advance number total is probably very, very high. Good thing we haven't stomped on this yet, isn't it? Also, as high as I set the idle, vacuum was pulling the vacuum advance, so that made it more like, I wanna say 45 degrees at idle. Yeah, it's never coming off a cold idle. Even though I can feel the choke stove is hot, it's not doing anything. So I bet the spring is installed wrong in there, and all we have is the vacuum pull off. Even idling down at 700, it still reads 27 degrees. I did verify this timing mark as being correct, just by the way. Here's problem number one. Notice our vacuum pistons are fluttering up and down at a low idle. That means our springs are too strong. And that's not super surprising. I really want to work on the timing here, but I kind of need to take a detour through the carburetor now. This is an Edelbrock 1411. Apparently, they come stock with a 110 main jet instead of the larger 113. And uh, the needles are interesting. Yeah, we're not going to be able to read that. But it's a 7547. That's super lean cruise and pretty lean on the power side, too. Because I have the step-up pistons out anyway to change the springs for weaker ones, I'm probably going to go ahead and try some 7037 needles and see what that does for us. Every single time I mess with Edelbrock carburetors, someone has to get into the comments and say, throw that junk away and replace it with a holly. Other times I'll be doing a video with a holly in it and people will say, throw that junk away and get an Edelbrock. So what I'm saying is the internet's a terrible place, but also what I'm saying is everyone has their own opinion. My opinion is that the Edelbrock is a great choice and here's why. I can completely tune the fuel curve just by changing these components, and it doesn't involve spilling a single drip of gas. Now, I didn't order this carburetor. If it were up to me, we'd have an AVS too, but we don't, we've got this. This is the Edelbrock 1411. This is a 750 CFM carb, but apparently the tuning that comes in it is for fuel economy, not necessarily for performance. We're trying to achieve some performance here, so that's not gonna do. But with that in mind, the stiff step-up springs make sense. These are the orange, which are actually a middle of the road unit. I'm gonna go for these. I think these are actually blue, not that they really look blue. They feel a good bit weaker. We'll see if that gives us the result we want. And I'm just gonna go ahead and do an experimental needle change at the same time. If it doesn't work out the way I want, again, it's really easy to change. Changing out the needles or metering rods as they're officially called could not be easier. You push down this spring and hold it, slide the old one out, slide the new one in, and release the spring. Make sure it's locked into its little groove there. Sometimes they don't get locked in and then they end up spiraling out of control up here at the top, which is not good. Apparently another common move people make with the 1411 is swapping out the 110 main jet for the 116. To do that, I'd have to take the lid off and I don't wanna, so we're just kinda gonna make the educated guess that the 7037 is gonna get us closer to where we wanna be and we'll go from there. You saw when the engine was running a minute ago how these covers were fluttering. That's because the pistons were cycling up and down at a low idle. What we wanna see is the doors all the way down until we rev the engine lightly. When we rev the engine lightly, we wanna see those pistons pop up and then they should go right back down when the engine returns to a low RPM. Okay, it's idling low, they're no longer fluttering. You see them popping up there? stronger springs because they're only barely jumping up that can hold them on the lean side which is also not what we want oh i just noticed a puddle under where this was parked last night recall i replaced the seal at the top of the box well the fluid found somewhere else to leak out of so that's lovely all right i got a headache partially from mild confusion but also partially from the fumes now here's the thing. This engine is equipped with a ridiculous thumper camshaft. Absolutely ridiculous. 
way too big for a regular street driving car. But you know, I had it and uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And in my defense, it sounds awesome, which was really the goal. I don't have the cam card for this thing, but I seem to recall it's either 525 lift or something in that region and some absolutely ridiculous amount of duration as well. Because of that, idle vacuum is always gonna be a problem, but we need to get as much vacuum as possible and hopefully the fueling in the carburetor will be dealable and hopefully the brake booster will kind of work, which it currently doesn't. So currently I'm searching around with my crappy old vacuum gauge, trying to find the highest idle vacuum possible. The biggest number I've seen was about 12. And of course it wasn't all that smooth either. Now to get there, I actually disconnected and capped the PCV valve. This is one of those PCV valve inside a chrome breather thingies. I don't actually hear it oscillating in there, so it might just be stuck open and it's just a vaguely controlled vacuum leak. Honestly, that whole thing's kind of bad news. It didn't fit in there very nicely. And as you can see, I wrapped it with tape to try and improve that. Uh, let's say mixed results. Now positive crankcase ventilation and smell extraction is really a good thing. And this is a street car, so we kind of want that. But again, we kind of want brakes too. So that two inches of mercury difference might be important. I'm gonna cap that for testing and see where that gets us. We may revisit this situation in the future, or it may just end up being a breather. With the PCV capped, I searched around for that best vacuum number, and it came at about 43 degrees of timing, which is pretty well in line with other engines of this type that I've dealt with. A lot of things starting to make sense with that new leak. Hopefully that's fixed now. So we've learned that at idle, our engine wants about 43 degrees of timing. I know from experience that this type of performance engine is gonna want a total timing number somewhere in the mid 30s. I would say 36, 38 degrees max. It's possible it would take more. This is an open chamber head, relatively low compression. Yeah, maybe, but I'm gonna say 36, 38 is a good point to shoot for. We can always test out more in the future. Now that total timing or max timing number I just gave is the number it'll want under heavy load, heavy acceleration. That's your go fast number. This thing wants more advance at idle than it does at full throttle. But a distributor is a device that adds degrees of timing. So how can we possibly make that happen? This is where that vacuum advance setup that Birdsong uses comes into play. You see, in the factory configuration, the vacuum advance on a Chrysler is only used off of idle. It's not used when the engine is idling at all. To accomplish this, the vacuum is connected to this. This is called ported vacuum. It's only exposed to vacuum when the throttle is slightly opened. So when the engine's sitting here idling, it shouldn't have vacuum at all, which means this advance does nothing. I know from previous experience that these vacuum modules generally yield about 19 degrees. So I'm gonna work on that assumption for now. We're gonna get 19 degrees or so out of that vacuum advance unit. Quick, easy math time. If we've got 19 degrees of vacuum advance, and let's say we're gonna get all of that at idle, more on that in a minute. We've got 19 degrees there, and the number we're shooting for is 43. So it stands to reason that where we need to set our distributor is 24 degrees of advance. 24 plus 19 is 43. We already know that 43 degrees under full throttle heavy load is way too many degrees and will probably lead to pinging and stuff. But the good news is, under that same heavy throttle situation, the vacuum is gonna go away, which means this timing will no longer be in effect, at least not to its fullest. Now I wanna make this make sense without getting too far off into the weeds, but essentially what's going on is, we've got a mechanical advance system in this distributor and a vacuum advance system in this distributor. Under certain conditions, they're both gonna contribute advance. Under certain conditions, none of them could contribute advance. We need to figure out a way to balance delicately between those two. Essentially, we're gonna rely on this vacuum advance for our nice idle, but we're gonna rely on the mechanical advance for power. The job the vacuum advance is used by Chrysler to achieve is extra timing during highway cruising, and we'll be able to take advantage of that too. But what we're really focused on is the idle and full throttle performance. What we need from this advance is for it to give us everything it's got at idle. And to make sure that happens, we're gonna turn to a setting that I haven't messed with on the channel, but I am fully aware of. Now people have dropped in the comments to tell me, hey, the vacuum advance is adjustable. As if I didn't read that in an article on Allpar in 2007. Oh, hey, a quick aside. I know I'm kind of bouncing around here between 
carburetor, distributor. But the thing you have to understand is all of these factors play together. Once we get our idle timing set, the amount of vacuum available is going to change, which is going to change the springs we need altogether. So I'm kind of going from one thing to the other. Just bear with me as I get this worked out. This is a Mighty Pack. It's a pretty handy tool. I actually mostly use this for vacuum bleeding brakes, but it can also be used for testing vacuum components. You don't necessarily need one of these to do what I'm doing here, you know, adjust the vacuum pod, but this is going to be really helpful because we're going to see at what vacuum, in inches of mercury, the vacuum advance is fully engaged. There are plenty of other vacuum pump type tools with a gauge that can do this job as well. Just know that I'm watching that gauge, which is red in inches of mercury, as I actuate the vacuum pump, and I'm watching the advance. Let's see what the gauge says when the advance stops moving. We gotta come up on it pretty slow here. I don't wanna go blowing past. Still moving. Okay, I think it stopped right there. That's 15, let's see. No, well, it went all the way to 17. 17 inches of mercury vacuum. We already know that at least at idle, the most vacuum we're ever gonna see is 12 inches of mercury. That means we need to adjust this spring. So let's just take a totally random number of turns here. That's uh. Let's try three. You just saw me loosening the adjustment screw there. I messed with this a few times off camera and tested it with the Mighty Vac. You actually tighten the screw to lower the amount of vacuum it takes to fully advance the pod. It's a little bit counterintuitive. I've got it tightened as far as it goes and 13 inches of vacuum now fully actuates the vacuum advance. And since that's slightly more vacuum than we're gonna see at idle, that means we probably won't get the full effect of this, but it's as close as we can get. It is kind of funny to realize that essentially what we're doing in there is the same thing we do by changing these step-up springs. We affect the amount of vacuum that makes the tuning change happen. Of course, the other reason we can't just leave the timing at 43 is because it starts like garbage that way. And if you remember that green 68 coronet video, I actually ruined a torque converter by having the timing set too far advanced, so you don't want that either. Recall from my math a minute ago that 24 degrees is probably what we'll have to have the base timing set to, and then we'll use the 19 or so for the vacuum to get to the timing we want at idle. I'm now going to use the Mighty Vac to confirm how many degrees come out of that distributor, and uh, we'll go from there. We should be able to hear the engine get happier and happier as I do this. Yeah, like that. The light confirms it's 19 degrees. Nice. For anybody fixated on that wobbly belt right now, I want you to know that I pulled this alternator pretty tight and it's nowhere near as loose as it looks. Just saying. Now, because I made that spring adjustment, before I move on, I wanted to check the flip side of this. How much vacuum does it take for this advance to start moving? The answer is right around five or six inches of mercury in vacuum. That means right in between those two numbers, something like seven or eight inches of mercury, you'll get about half of the vacuum advance. Under a full throttle situation, we want no advance contributed by the vacuum at all. So, as long as under full throttle, the vacuum in the engine is under five inches of mercury, we'll be just fine there. The question is then every point in between, full throttle and idle. Will that vacuum be acceptable? I think it will, but we're gonna find out in testing. Time to introduce some maths. We've got our best idle at 43 degrees, and the vacuum pod gives us 19 degrees of that. So the math I spitballed earlier, 24 degrees at base. That seems about right. That 24 degrees plus the 19, which I achieved with the Mighty Vac, and it idled pretty nicely. Our total timing number under heavy acceleration at high RPM, I'm gonna shoot for 38 degrees. I think that's gonna be about right for this combination. That number could need to go up or down a couple degrees either direction. Probably not up, we're gonna be listening very carefully for pinging. So following that, we've got a 38 degree total number and a 24 degree base number off the mechanical side of the distributor. The math from there is as follows. We want 38 degrees total, and we want to set the base timing at 24 degrees. That means the timing curve we need is 12 degrees. The problem we're gonna have, as usual, is that the amount of mechanical advance in this distributor is going to far exceed the 12 degree curve we want. Now there are several different versions of these distributors depending on what year it originally came in. I've seen curves from 20, 22 degrees up to like 32 degrees. So we need to figure out what we're dealing with here and then figure out what modification needs to be made. 
Now, as usual, I'm using my fancy dial back timing light to accomplish this. I'll check the timing at idle, then I'll rev the engine up to say 2800, 3000 RPM, and I'll check it again. Then we'll subtract the small number from the big number, and we'll find out how many degrees are in this distributor total. If you don't have a dial back, you can use a standard timing light and add extra marks to your balancer so you can just eyeball those lines. It's a little trickier, more work involved, but this costs more money, so you decide which one you like best. Okay, I revved the engine up and held it, adjusted my light, leaked some more coolant out of a header bolt, and the number I saw was 50. That means we've currently got a 26 degree curve in this distributor. I will be pulling and resealing every one of these header bolts soon. But I wanted to go for the glory of making it run awesome first. Hey, I have a question. Why are there magic juices leaking out of our coil? That shouldn't be happening. Now I know some commenter is gonna say, because the coil is laid on its side. You can't lay your coil on its side. And still more commenters are going to say, because your coil is mounted to the engine, you can't mount your coil to your engine. I'm going to go ahead and head those comments off at the pass and remind everyone involved that Chrysler mounted all of their V8 coils sideways on their engines for decades. And it should be fine. Therefore, I unfortunately have to conclude that this Edelbrock Max Fire coil is total garbage. More on that later, I guess. Remember, this is a Mopar, so you can only reinstall your distributor the right way or the wrong way. So before you pull it, make sure you note which way your rotor's pointing. This seems like as good a time as any to remind you that these techniques will work on things that aren't Mopars, but of course, this is Dead Dodge Garage, so that's where we're at. If you happen to be doing this on a different type of engine that has the gear attached to the distributor and the rotor twists when you pull it out, Go ahead and bring your engine up to TDC, mark that location, and then try really hard to get it back where it was when you put it back in. The distributor's out on the bench, and it's time for some more good old-fashioned hackery. But before that, I think it's time for some leftover pizza. Mmm, leftover pizza and birthday cake. Anyway, if you don't feel qualified to, like, tear into this thing and weld on it and put it back together, don't! Either find someone that is, or take the easy way out. Go over to Summit Racing and buy their knockoff of the Direct Connection Mopar Performance Adjustable Unit. Thankfully, this thing has a steel sleeve instead of the old school nylon. The nylon retaining sleeves break often. On old production distributors, there's a snap ring down there you have to take out. On these newer ones, it's a Phillips screw. I'll take the Phillips screw, thank you. Again, I've covered all of this in previous videos, but just to beat the dead horse slightly, the cliff notes version of how this works is you've got weights here attached to springs. As this shaft spins faster and faster inside your distributor, the weights move outward. The size of that slot dictates the timing curve of this distributor. So what we're going to do is weld that slot maybe about that far shut. That way, this thing can still move all the way to the outside, but it won't fully return anymore. The magic number we're looking for again is 12 degrees. Since this whole slot is good for 25 or 26 or so, and we need about half as much movement. You can see I've drawn a line on there. That is the very back of the pin in that slot. So that's as far back as it would ever need to travel. I'll weld this up and then I'll definitely end up filing it for a nice, straight, smooth finish. Note, I also filed off the coating inside the slot there where I'm gonna weld. Hopefully that's sufficient. I'm gonna carefully and precisely weld this in my high-tech fab shop, which is also known as the one clear spot of floor by my welder. Really? Come on. Why? What did I do? Hello? This is because I put an AVE sticker on my welder, isn't it? Hmm. You know, this sucks. Yay! Hood's not working. I'm totally blind. Oh yeah, of course, because it put itself in grind mode again. Yay! Yay! Oh, the magical electric blue. You know, if I could see anything, that'd be great. Did you know hot things are hot? Anyway, there's the line. There's my weld. I'm going to grind that on the top and then file out the slot and hopefully it'll be absolutely perfect. I always forget someone did me a favor and labeled my welding gloves. <laughs> so 
sometime today. There's the thing. There's the thing. Almost there. Not quite reaching the bottom of the line, but very close. I'm gonna call that good enough. Now I'm gonna go finish this on the grinder because I'm tired of filing. It's not just good, it's pretty much good enough. Note the difference in size between those two slots. Also note, you do only need to weld up the one. That alone will limit the movement of the distributor, so you'll be good. Bird! I'm trying to edit my commentary for context and accuracy. And it's back together like it never happened. If everything went to plan there, we'll now have much less advance. I loosened the choke stove to check it. It's definitely hooked into the linkage in there correctly. And you could tell that because with it loose, as you turn it back and forth, if it moves the choke flapper both directions, it is engaged correctly. I ended up moving the adjustment to about here. It was about here, but I find that normally they need to be closer to that to work correctly. Lukewarm start. Nice. Why did I think I was going for a 12 degree curve? I wanted a 14 degree curve. Whatever, anyway, I got 12. Well, that's pretty close. I'm kidding myself if I really thought I could get within two degrees with a welder and a file anyway. Now with our vacuum advance connected. Uh, something might happen. I had to give the idle screw a tiny bump. Now we're right around 950 to 980 RPM idle. And the idle timing is 42. Now what's one degree among friends, you know? It, uh, it sounds like it wants to party. All right, we're definitely close. But what's it like when we drop it in gear? Yeah, okay. You know, this is a 2,500-ish stall converter. This cam definitely could use a bigger one, but we didn't want to go there. This seems like a decent compromise for the street. It doesn't stall when it goes in gear, so that's good. But how does it start? Yeah, okay. It did fight the starter a tiny bit. We're probably just gonna have to live with that. With that done, I was able to lean out the idle mixture again. Another quarter turn or so seems to be about right. They're now only about three quarters to one turn out. That's kind of low, but I was able to tune it, so I'm gonna call that a win. Watch our piston covers here. Notice they're hopping right up and then popping right back down. I ended up putting in a different set of orange springs that seemed ever so slightly weaker. And that, with the vacuum change, made that setting perfect. God, I hit my head on the friggin' thing. I hate the thing. Well, I'm being optimistic, so I put the air cleaner back on. Let's go test this thing. If my calculations are correct, it's gonna be awesome and safe. We shouldn't hear any pinging. But if we do, we'll come back and make adjustments from there. Did you know that late B and E body hoods are just terrible? They always wanna stick up at the back. I've found that pushing rearward as you go down can help, but the other thing that helps is closing them here instead of at the front. Time to test it. Nice. I need to take another stab at that alternator. The belt is tight, so I think it's actually a pulley alignment issue. Shocking, I know. All right, continued weirdness. As I'm backing it out, it's just occasionally turning off as if someone hit the key. I mean, it could be a tune-up issue, but it doesn't really seem like it. Oh yeah, and as far as the brakes, better, but still not great. Good clue that your cam is too big. Hit your brake pedal and then hit the gas a bit. And if the pedal goes down because your brake booster starts doing something, yeah, you don't have enough vacuum. We may well be putting a vacuum pump on this. My favorite. Maybe the stalling is a tune-up issue. It only did it those two times and now it's fine. I could raise the idle speed a bit more, but I hate to do that. 
<laughs> okay, it's uh, it's better. The brake is better in that it actually does something, but it's not enough. So, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty good. And after you rev the engine like that, it makes a vacuum and then the brakes work. So that's great. I don't know if you've noticed yet, but the speedometer is actually not accurate. We're putting 355 sure grip gears in an eight and three quarter axle in this car later, and that'll be another video. But currently the speedo gear is set for those 355s, but we have like two nines. So yeah, it's way wrong. I have been doing this same exact test drive for two and a half years, and that is in no way depressing. All right, listen for pinging. <laughs> oh, it's really good. And this is still with like two nines. This thing's gonna be psycho. I don't know about you, but I didn't hear any pinging either. So I think we're pretty close. That breakup that it had before is just gone. It's smooth power. Nice. In case any of my neighbors are watching, I'm never the does donuts here guy. Sometimes I'm the does burnouts here guy, but never the donuts. It stalled the moment I turned the camera off. Yeah, maybe a little bump in the idle speed. Yeah, definitely a little bump in the idle speed. Actually, I had another thought. What if when it goes in gear, the vacuum falls off the timing goes away a little bit, the vacuum falls off even more, and then my new much lower idle mixture setting is way too low, it leans out and dies. I could test the theory now, but I didn't bring a screwdriver. What a riot. It's getting pretty good. Obviously we need to tweak it a little bit, but that's fine. Maybe if I don't say anything, no one will notice that this is exactly how the last video on this car ended. Except it sounds way more awesome now. <laughs> if you want to see a real burnout, like a giant smoky one with two tires and everything, you're going to have to wait until we're done with that axle swap and until the owner gives me express written permission because yeah, this car is like brand new, fully restored, and there are a lot of dollars wrapped up in it. I'll tell you what, it's getting pretty good. I'm very pleased. Brakes, yeah, they work. <sighs> yeah, we're probably just gonna have to do a vacuum pump for like sitting in traffic, basically. When you're going down the road and you hit the brakes, there's enough vacuum stored up in the booster that they're fine. Well, sometimes they're fine. Ugh, yeah. It just sounds so awesome. Yes, it's definitely got one of them hot for teacher cams. I've suddenly become very aware that the visors haven't been installed yet. I'm completely blind. The tint strip does help a little bit. Yeah, I think it was those goofy mixture screw settings. I set them back to your standard one and a half turns and it's fine. I've always done that by ear, but with a cam like this, it's a little hard to tell what you're hearing sometimes. It steers, it sometimes brakes, and it sure goes. Ah! Uh, but does it diesel when I shut it off? No. Now it kind of smells rich at idle, like that was too much. But it didn't help the stalling at all, so. I don't know, with the weird starting, stalling, cutting out thing, maybe there's like an actual ignition component issue here. When it dies, it sounds like you turn the key off. Plus, you know, there was that one time it wouldn't start. I don't know, dude, there's some weird mysterious things afoot. Quickly, I wanna head off some more comments at the pass and mention that there is a common hot rodder trick used on ridiculous engines, adding extra idle air to help tune the idle mixture. This can be done by drilling holes in the throttle blades or adding some bypass air. Uncle Tony did a great video on that some time back where he used a chunk of rubber hose and one of those little air valves for fish tanks. That may well be something we need to look at to help this idle stalling thing. For now, it's pretty close. More on that in the future. Obviously, we need to tweak it. 
But the good news is, as far as the timing curve is concerned, I'm happy. This thing sounds amazing. If you've got a similarly built 440 to this one, stupid ridiculous cam that's way too big and open chamber heads with not nearly enough compression, you can go ahead and copy these numbers, but there's a really good chance your needs are gonna vary a bit. Hopefully you at least took away enough information to kinda sorta start feeling this out on your car. A quick but important note on tuning. Before you attempt anything like this, make sure you've got a full complement of happy cylinders. You know, eight reasonably fresh plugs, all your plug wires are like connected, your cap and rotor are in good shape, your coil's not oozing fluid everywhere. Gee, Jamie, maybe that's part of your problem. We'll deal with that later. For now, that's all I've got. We'll definitely be seeing more on this car in the near future. If you have any questions on tuning like this or comments, input, brilliant thoughts, go ahead and let me know in the comments. Until then, thank you very much for watching. And remember, unhook your battery at night. Just trust me on that one. Because fire is bad. Oh yeah, it's all coming together.